want to talk today about processes for actually evaluating our models that we're learning via these machine learning methods that we've been talking about. And particularly, we want to be able to do this in a robust way. We've already talked in class about a variety of these issues, and now I want to really kind of bring this together and talk about them all, to, all in one place and talk about what options we actually have as we're uh, trying to solve these problems. So we want to achieve a, a variety of different things uh, as we go through this reliability uh, type of process. Um, first off, we want to be able to convince ourselves and other people that any of the models that we are putting forward are actually going to work uh, with data that we haven't seen before, and in particular uh, with data that we're going to see in the future. We also want to have uh, a very good sense uh, about how the model performs uh, as a function of a variety of different things, in particular the specific training data that we're actually using to construct those models, as well as the size of that training uh, data set. We also want to be able to select our model hyperparameters in a formal way. And when we have multiple model types sitting in front of us, we want to have some formal way of comparing those two in, in sort of a bake-off kind of a scenario so that we can ultimately choose one to put forward, say, into operation. All right, so a few definitions. Uh, when I use the word parameters, um, what I mean by this is that these are parameters that are actually selected by our learning algorithm. Hyperparameters are also parameters, but these are specified from the outside. So typically, we as uh, practitioners are making decisions about them, or we have some sort of other meta algorithm that is making decisions about what those parameters are all about. So these hyperparameters will affect how our different learning algorithms actually behave. So we talked about uh, regularization types of parameters. We also might have hyperparameters associated with uh, the structure of the models that we're using. So in the deep learning world, we might have hyperparameters associated with number of layers or how many hidden units we might have in a given layer, uh, et cetera. Another uh, uh, key definition is model type. So these are broad category of models. So I might have a deep network. I might have a support vector machine or a decision tree or a linear model, uh, et cetera. And ultimately, it's that model type where we're, we're actually doing those, those bake-offs uh, uh, against. All right, so, so uh, let's talk about the, really the data universe. So this is the universe of all possible samples that we can actually draw from uh, the, the world. Uh, so this is all possible scenarios. This might also be all uh, possible uh, time. And uh, when we're actually building uh, our models, uh, one possibility, and this is really the ideal scenario, uh, is that we can observe that entire data universe. We build a model uh, that explains all of those samples, and then we're done. And because we've actually accessed the entire data universe, um, we can ensure that any uh, future samples that we draw, we've, we've already seen them, and we already know that the model performs well. So th this is a, a great concept. Um, however, uh, it is not terribly practical in lots of the scenarios, at least the interesting scenarios that we're, that, that we're working in. Um, so typically, it's just not feasible to sample the entire uh, universe. And even if we could sample the entire universe, uh, depending upon the learning algorithm that we're using, it may not be computationally feasible to make use of uh, that size of data set. So a second approach uh, is that we uh, don't try to access the entire universe, but instead uh, we uh, sample a subset for our training purposes. So that's indicated here by the, the green box. We can also uh, access a, a separate data set. Uh, that is independently statistically from this, this training set. And I'll term that uh, as the test set. And once we've constructed a model based on that training set, we uh, can then present the model with this independent uh, data set and ask what the performance is 
uh, with respect to that model. There are lots of different learning algorithms out there. Many are incremental in nature, so the gradient descent kinds of algorithms that we uh, use that, that are necessary for our nonlinear models that, that we implement, for example. Uh, and uh, really the, the ideal type of uh, performance that we might see out of a training set uh, looks like this. So uh, in, initially, when before we've started actually applying the, the learning algorithm, uh, our performance error or prediction error on the, that training data might be very high. And over time, that uh, tr the, our performance improves uh, such that we asymptote to some low level error here. Uh, it's uh, so if we're doing true gradient descent, we would expect this type, this blue curve to to, to happen. Ideally, uh, with this independent data set, uh, we which is in orange here, uh, that also follows the same sort of pattern where uh, performance uh, prediction error might start out a bit high. This is it's lower than the blue curve because it's after our first step of training, uh, but uh, over time, that independent data set performance also uh, starts to, to drop, and, and it asymptotes at about the same level as, as our training set. So this is the ideal scenario. Typically, we're very far from this ideal. And, and let me show you a little bit more uh, realistic type of uh, scenario here. So unfortunately, the, the colors changed in this figure. I apologize for that. Training data now here is this lower curve in, in red. This independent data are, uh, are shown in, uh, in green here. Uh, and typically what happens is performance uh, with respect to error here drops uh, in both cases for a while. And then at some point they begin to separate from, from one another. And uh, as we continue to train, training performance, again, since we're doing gradient descent with respect to the training set, uh, continues to drop and ultimately asymptotes to some level. Uh, but at, at this far right-hand side, we're actually starting to, the model is starting to uh, really capture the, the odd uh, peculiarities of, the, uh, of its training, of the training data set. And at that point, our ability to interpolate or even extrapolate uh, solutions for this independent data set begin to, uh, to wane. And, and so performance on the, this independent data set uh, continues to go up here. So there's really a, uh, so, th so there's a period where performance isn't very good, but, but the two are tracking. And then there's a period where they begin to separate and and in fact, uh, we hit a, a minimum in this, uh, the, somewhere in this region here. So this is the ideal place for us to actually stop the, the training process and not to actually continue to go uh, uh, back upwards following that green curve. So a lot of the gradient scent methods that, that, uh, that we talk about here, and this is very much the case in the deep learning side of things, uh, will actually have a mechanism for detecting when performance with respect to an independent data set begins to uh, creep uh, upwards, uh, error begins to creep upwards, uh, and will actually terminate the, the training process such that we're left with a solution within this range here. A little bit of extra terminology here. Uh, this left-hand side region here, this is referred to as underfitting, where the, the model really hasn't hasn't really started to capture the the, the uh, shape of the the data, and uh, on the right hand side, uh, we've we've now started to to focus on the the, the strangenesses of this specific training set and uh, started to drift away from the, uh, the the statistics of the the rest of the universe. Okay, so so this is one of those kinds of problems that we. Uh, actually want to be able to uh, solve uh, using an independent, and, and we can use an independent data set to, to uh, detect this. 
Okay, so how do we go about combating this overfitting? Uh, there are actually a whole variety of different techniques. We've talked about one already. Uh, so one is that we can increase our training set size. And in doing so, hopefully we're capturing the better the true statistics of the, the, the training, the, the full universe of, of data. Um, we can also reduce the complexity of the models that we're uh, learning. So we reduce the, we change the structure such that the number of parameters uh, is reduced. We can also begin to add to our cost functions or our error functions uh, terms that try to force in an algorithmic way simpler models. So, so we can add uh, some form of, uh, uh, we can add some term such as L2 regularization or L1 regularization that tries to reduce the magnitudes of either the square or, or the, the absolute value of uh, all the parameters in the, uh, in the model. Uh, or there are also some, some implicit mechanisms in the deep learning world. Uh, dropout is, is one of those mechanisms where we randomly reduce the, the complexity of a model uh, at each of our epochs, uh, and then we restore the complexity and, and then reduce it again. And, and that has a tendency to uh, also implicitly do regularization for us. And then what we talked about uh, a moment ago was a technique called early stopping, where we use that independent data set uh, to detect when we begin to overfit, and then we can halt the, the gradient descent process uh, at that point in time. So uh, a few other points here. Uh, when we build our models, this is fundamentally a, a stochastic process. So just sampling from the universe of possible data, that is that is in and of itself is a sampling process. And a lot of the learning algorithms that we use also have some sort of a stochastic element to them. So for a lot of our methods, the we, we randomly pick initial set of an initial set of parameters uh, from some sort of a distribution. Uh, we've also talked about different kinds of gradient descent uh, approaches where we don't use our entire training set, but we'll select random subsets of the training set to take a gradient descent step. Uh, or uh, in the case of decision trees, uh, we might take a random sampling of the possible question types rather than looking at all possible questions. So in, for any of these reasons, uh, building a model is, uh, is a stochastic process and we have to actually uh, treat it as such. So what this means is when we build a model and then measure performance, uh, we are, uh, we're actually sampling from a random variable uh, of performance metrics. So, so we actually, uh, we can't actually uh, do that process once, build the model, measure performance. That single observation from this random variable isn't sufficient to actually conclude much about how this model is going to perform in the future or how it's going to uh, perform relative to other kinds of models. Uh, so, so the answer to this from the statistics world is let's, let's uh, sample multiple times from these uh, random variables. And once we have a population of samples, then we can begin to compare those distributions. And this is where our hypothesis testing tools come into play. So here's uh, a picture of uh, yet a, a third approach. And uh, I'm putting a name to this now, and we'll nail that down a little bit more here in a, in a minute. Um, so what we're doing now is instead of sampling a single training set, test set pair, we're actually sampling n of these. So calling them 0 through n minus 1. So we use uh, this training set right here to construct model zero, and then we can measure the performance of that model with respect to this test set over here, and that gives us performance uh, measure zero. Uh, and then that process is repeated. We, we have a, a, another model that we build with a statistically independent uh, data set, 
So that gives that gives us M1, and then we can measure its performance with respect to another data set that's statistically independent of everything else that we've we've done so far. And that gives us a, a P1 and on down uh, the line. So in the end, we end up constructing in different models and we have in different performance measures. So when we do things in this way, uh, assuming that our sampling procedures are uh, really IID, then uh, then our performance measures are also statistically independent of uh, one another. Uh, and, uh, and so this gives us an IID uh, set of samples for for a distribution. Uh, and with that, we can start to use our statistical tools to answer a variety of questions. So did we learn anything? Uh, or how does this uh, particular model type that we've uh, constructed, how does that compare with other model types? Uh, if, if we happen to have constructed two different model types using the same pairs of training and evaluation uh, sets, then we can actually in, uh, make use of that fact to build uh, paired statistical tests. Uh, otherwise, we, we can make use of uh, two sample types of tests. Uh, and, and a reasonable type of an approach here is to, uh, is to use a student T uh, test to do the comparison between our different models. Um, in particular, that's a, a statistical test about the means of the distribution. So what's the mean error provided by this model type and what's the mean error provided by this model type, right? This third approach has a number of uh, different challenges. Uh, and uh, the first observation here is that uh, each of our model types, these are not monolithic choices. We just don't choose a model type and we go and we're, and we're done. But many of the model types that we are, are making use of have uh, different hyperparameter choices that have to be made. So we might be introducing L2 regularization for a regression problem, or we might have a, a, a parameter that affects the complexity of a node uh, leaf node in a decision tree. These are all hyperparameters that have to be chosen uh, ahead of time before the learning progresses. Uh, and before we can compare model type A to model type B, we have to home in on what those choices are for the hyperparameters for each of those models. So the question is, how do we actually make the, this choice? Uh, the first observation is that hyperparameters really can dramatically affect how uh, a model uh, overfits or does not overfit uh, the, the data. Uh, and this is something we can't actually uh, detect, therefore, um, using our training uh, data set. So we really have to have an independent data set in order to uh, detect these kinds of scenarios. Um, however, if we make use of this test data set that we've been talking about, then we run the risk of really overfitting our hyperparameter choices to this data set. And, and in some sense, what's happened now is that this test data set is it working its way into uh, the training procedure because it's we're using it to uh, actually make choices about the models. And, and so this really taints the test data set and meaning that we really can't trust performance uh, with respect to the, the test data set for the next step, which is the formal comparison from between model A and model B. So we have to be able to solve uh, this type of a problem. All right, so that, this takes us to uh, a, a, another set of definitions here. Um, uh, so uh, training set, uh, so, so we're imagining different kinds of data sets here. Uh, and ideally, these are all statistically uh, independent of one another. So a training set, we're using that with the learning algorithm to make choices about parameters. Validation set, we're going to use to make choices such as where do we stop training if we're doing a gradient descent kind of an approach. Uh, and we're also going to use its performance to uh, make uh, hyperparameter choices. And, and then we're going to reserve a, a separate test set for actually either reporting the performance of our models 
uh, or if we are comparing model A to model B, then we can use the test performance to, to do those comparisons. So here's uh, yet another uh, approach uh, where we've sampled now n times three different data sets from the universe of, of data. So for model zero, what we do is we uh, use the training set uh, to train up the parameters in model zero, and then we can uh, measure the performance with respect to a validation set uh, and this independent test set that gives us two uh, different metrics, a V0 and a TE0. Uh, and then for model one, that's uh, trained up with a separate training set and, and then evaluated with respect to validation, a separate validation set and test set. So that gives us V1 and, and TE1, uh, et cetera. So in the end, we have really two N uh, performance metrics, N for validation data and N for test data. So the, some specifics here, uh, we can use the performance metric uh, for the i uh, model, uh, use v, the validation performance uh, to make a choice about when we end the training process. So that's that early stopping idea. Uh, and then we can also compute the average over all of the VIs to, uh, to talk about the performance of a given hyperparameter uh, choice, uh, and uh, and then use that to compare to other hyperparameter choices. Once we have uh, made a choice as to what the ideal hyperparameters are for this model type, then we can look at and use our test performance for final evaluation and comparison between the, the models. So that is this bake-off type of uh, scenario. All right, so uh, there are a few challenges with this. Uh, at, up to this point, we've really made this assumption that we can just sample from the data universe pretty arbitrarily, and it doesn't really cost us much. It's easy to do, um, but in practice, we are really limited in our ability to collect uh, or or label data. Sometimes it's really easy to collect data, but actually to have reliable labels for our different examples, uh, that, that can be problematic. So by labeling, I mean here, our desired uh, output for, for our models for, for each of the examples. Um, however, given these limitations, we still want to have a sound way of making hyperparameter choices and for comparing our models. Uh, and, and along the way, we'd also like to have an algorithm for uh, really looking at the sensitivity of the model uh, with respect to the, the size of the training set. All right, so uh, yet another approach, this is number five, is uh, something that the, the community right now calls in-fold cross-validation. Uh, and, and the idea is that we sample really two different data sets. Uh, there's a, a test set here. You'll often see this term holdout set. Uh, and, and then it's some hopefully large uh, data set that we will use for training and validation. Uh, and, then, and then what we're going to do is take that green section and cut it into n different folds. So I have those numbered 0 through n minus 1 here. And, and then we'll use different subsets of these folds for training and for validation. So here's what that process looks like. Uh, so for model zero, uh, refer to this as rotation zero, where uh, the training set is using folds zero through n minus two. Uh, and then that leaves fold n minus one by which we can compute performance for the validation set. And then on the next rotation, uh, model one uses folds one through n minus one, and we reserve fold zero for validation. And on down the line, in the last case, validation is at n minus two, and then training set is, is drawn from uh, the, both the, the, the left and right hand sides here. So this, this gives us n different uh, validation set uh, performance metrics. Um, individually, each one is uh, independent 
of the training data that was used for uh, creating this particular model. So one, so a few specifics here. First off, a given example in the uh, universe of data uh, occurs in exactly one of our folds. Um, and what that means is that uh, that our training and validation uh, data sets are independent of uh, one another. Um, we can still use the, the VI uh, for, for the i model or i rotation uh, to make a choice about when we actually complete the training process for model I. And, and then we can use the average of the, the Vs to compare our different hyperparameter choices. So, so the, the typical approach is then uh, compare, uh, compute this average V for each of our hyperparameter choices and then pick the one that is best. And what we call that hyperparameter choice H star. Once we've uh, made that step of, of choosing H star, we can then actually look at the test set performance. So, so the procedure here uh, is, is that uh, we evaluate each of our N models with the same test data set. And this gives us N different metrics. So TE zero through TE N minus one. Uh, and then if we're comparing to a, a different model type, we can do the same thing. That same test data set uh, yields TE zero prime out to TE N minus one prime. And, and that gives us a population of, of samples uh, for our two different models. And we can then uh, use hypothesis testing to compare these two different distributions. So th this is what is very common out in, in uh, a lot of the writing these days and in industry. Um, if, if we're thinking in terms of then, uh, uh, using this bake off to make a decision about which model is the best and then putting this model into production. Uh, a, a very common thing to do is to train a final model uh, using all of the all in of the available folds uh, and our chosen hyperparameter set. Uh, and then we can evaluate that with respect to our test data set, report that, and then use this model in a production type of a scenario. But off, often in the uh, research world, we tend not to take this last step. So we prefer to stick with the, uh, the N different uh, performance metrics. Okay, so, so this is, as I'm, I've said, this is the dominant approach that's out there today in 2022. So many papers talk about this, a huge number of blog posts talk about this procedure. Uh, books about machine learning, especially the popular ones, uh, talk about this type of an approach. And, and in fact, th these procedures are built into our standard toolkits. So for example, scikit-learn has a function called cross-val predict that will actually execute this procedure for you. Um, however, there's a problem with this approach. And, uh, and what it comes down to is that uh, we're using the same test data set to compute our performance metrics for all N of our models. So what this means is that our performance met measure metrics are actually not uh, independent of one another. And, and this violates our, uh, our standard assumptions uh, for many of our hypothesis testing tools. So if you're trying to use a z-test or a t-test to, uh, to argue for uh, the mean of one model performance being better than the mean of another, uh, we, we have to uh, at least try to take some steps to make sure that those are uh, independent measures. And we very we violated that in a really big way here. Um, so um, what I'm advocating is that we actually uh, deviate from what's actually done in, uh, in the real world. So there are a variety of different choices. We're going to explore both of these and uh, actually in the opposite order, what I have listed here. Um, so one possibility is that we cut our test data set 
uh, we, we don't use the same test data set for all n of our models, but instead we cut it into n independent folds and, and then use a different fold for each one of our n models. So, so, so that will help, re that'll restore independence. Um, however, uh, it does increase the variance of our performance metrics. And, uh, and this could make it harder to detect when we have, uh, when, when we have a difference between our different modeling approaches. Uh, and it's especially acute when we have scenarios where we have very small data sets, uh, or we have data sets where we have very small number of examples of certain kinds of uh, certain parts of the, the universe. So if I'm doing classification uh, and I have a uh, hundred examples of one type of class to one example of another type of class or a thousand to one uh, type of a ratio, um, then that can actually uh, lead to problems in, in these, uh, uh, with these uh, smaller test data sets. Uh, the other approach, which we'll talk about next, is uh, one of actually drawing our test data from the original set of folds. Uh, that that we uh, constructed. So, um, so this is what I'm I term holistic n-fold cross validation. Uh, so we're going to take our entire data set, cut it into n uh, independent folds, and for uh, for each of our models, we're going to use n minus two of the folds for training, one fo fold for validation, and one fold for testing, and then we will. Uh, rotate all of those uh, through uh, our n different possibilities. So, so this is what this process uh, looks like. So for model zero or rotation zero, we use fold zero through n minus three for the training process. We use n minus two for uh, validation and n minus one for testing. Once we trained up model zero, that yields two different performance metrics uh, validation zero and testing zero. Model one, this is just a rotation to the right mod n. Uh, so validation set moves from n minus two to n minus one. Test moves from n minus one to zero. And then training is everything uh, in between one to n minus two. That, that training set gives us model one. And, and then from that, we have uh, validation performance one and testing performance one. And then if we keep rotating, our final model that we build is one that looks like this, where validation set performance is sitting at n minus three test, uh, sorry, the validation set data is n minus three test uh, data or fold n minus two, and then training data or n minus one and zero through uh, n minus four. And that yields uh, validation performance n minus one and testing performance n minus one. So again, we have uh, we have n measures for our validation performance. We have n measures for our uh, testing performance. So a few specifics as far as implementation goes. Um, we can again use validation performance uh, for the ith model. Uh, we can monitor that as training progresses in order to make a choice about when to stop the training process. So we're preventing overfitting by early stopping. Uh, and then we can use the average over all of the VIs uh, to um, make choices about a particular, uh, about which of the hyperparameter uh, sets that we, uh, that we want, the, which one we want to use for this model type. So, so we're here, we're, in this case, we're just choosing the one with the best average validation performance. And we call that hyperparameter set H star, just as we did before. The way I've talked about things, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, we actually compute the TE zero to TE n minus one along the way, but it's really important uh, that these just be cached and nothing, not the human, not an algorithm, look at these until we've made a choice about H star. And only after that choice is made, are you allowed to look at the, the test set performance for that particular hyperparameter choice and not any of the others. 
Okay, so evaluation, in this case, we're comparing two different model types. Uh, so for model type one, we identify an H star, we extract the, those cached test performance metrics for H star. For model type two, we do the same. So an H star prime gives us uh, our test performance TE zero prime to TE n minus one prime. And then we can use our hypothesis testing uh, to compare these two different distributions. And because a given sample in our data set only occurs in exactly one of our folds, we can make a reasonable argument that, uh, well, it's, it's true for one model. Um, uh, the, the model training data are independent of the validation data, and those are independent of the, uh, the test data. Uh, so we feel pretty confident to, uh, about that. Uh, and, uh, and hence, we feel pretty confident about taking this kind of an approach where, uh, where we've then used our test, uh, our, our test folds uh, to uh, measure the performance of model type one and model type two, uh, and then using our t-test, for example, to compare those distributions. Okay, so there are a few caveats. Uh, there's a technicality in that uh, the training uh, data, we're using one less fold in, in this holistic cross-validation process than with cross-validation, um, but we're, we're actually not uh, using a holdout set for testing anymore, so we, we probably haven't lost anything in that situation. Um, either way, um, the, the whether we're using cross-validation or holistic cross-validation, our training sets overlap a lot, and hence they are not independent of one another. So the models themselves, we cannot argue that they're independent of one another. Um, so by some stretch, one could argue that the test performance measures are not really in, independent of one another. In practice, this is not something that we worry too much about. Um, one can actually, there is a, a meta procedure that does cross-validation multiple times with different partitionings of the data into different folds. Uh, and that process can actually uh, detect when there are issues. Um, but in practice, we tend not to worry about this. Okay, uh, so, so how do we uh, use this procedure to uh, make uh, some statements about the sensitivity of our training procedure to our training set size. Uh, so, so this is sort of an idealized kind of picture of what uh, that sensitivity might look like. Uh, so we have uh, our training set error as is in blue here uh, as a function of the, the size of the data set. So for very small uh, data sets, it's very easy to, to model the data with whatever model we have. And so error tends to be very low. And as we add more data, we're adding more complexity uh, to the set of points that we're trying to fit. And, and so we tend to have error coming up as we increase the training set size. Um, however, it, it does asymptote at some point. With an in, independent data set, a validation data set specifically, uh, the, the, we actually, uh, the, the, the curve is opposite in some sense. So with a, a tiny training set, uh, the, it's very easy for the model to capture all of the details of that training data. But when we ask it to interpolate or extrapolate to other situations, it performs very poorly. So it's not uncommon to have a very high validation error in that situation. And then as we add more data to the training process, what happens is that the, the learn model starts to better reflect the statistics of the entire universe of, of uh, data. And that means that our models tend to uh, perform better when we draw another sample from the uh, universe of, of uh, uh, possible samples. And so uh, ideally, if one were to do the experiment of train up a, a model uh, with a variety of different training set sizes, ideally these two curves actually will asymptote together uh, at some point in time. 
Uh, if they do not, if you find yourself in, say, this situation here where you have the, the, the you're, you're using all of your available data to train up a model and your validation performance is, is very poor as compared to your training performance, then that is a good indication that you're dramatically overfitting your data. And it's, it's only when those two curves come together do we feel confident that uh, these models are properly generalizing to this other data set. Okay, so we want to understand what's happening uh, with our particular model type as the training set size changes. Uh, and as a function of that, we might actually make different choices about the hyperparameters that we're uh, that, that we are uh, using. So, uh, so we, we can actually ask this question with our holistic infold cross validation procedure. And we, uh, and uh, so in this case, um, even though there might be n minus two training folds available uh, for a given model, we're only going to use k of those. And then those k actually rotate uh, uh, with the validation and, and test sets so that we end up with a variety of different models. So that procedure looks uh, like this. So this is the case where our training set size is exactly one fold. And you can see um, here in red, that's the one that we're selecting. We're ignoring folds one through n minus three for training purposes. Uh, so we'll train up the model with that, that data that gives us a model, model zero. And then we can ask what the performance is for uh, validation and test data. Uh, and, uh, and then for the next rotation, uh, we use fold one to create the model and then use n minus one and z fold zero for validation and test uh, uh, measurements respectively and on down the line. With uh, two folds, uh, the training set size grows. So here we're using zero and one uh, and for model zero and then for model one, we're using folds one and two uh, and on down the line. Uh, so at this point with, with one fold, all of the training, training uh, data were independent from one model to the next. Here, now we begin to uh, overlap that training data. For uh, three folds, zero, one, and two are used for rotation zero, one, two, and three are, are used for model one. A tiny bit of Python code for you. Uh, here, I'm assuming I've got variables n folds, which tell me how many folds I have in total. Uh, train size is the number of folds that we'll use for our training set, and that we're assuming is in the range of one to n folds minus two. Uh, and then rotation is one of zero through and folds minus one. And that tells us which of those models that we're constructing. Uh, so for uh, val folds, uh, this is just a, uh, this just computes wh which fold is being used for our validation. So number of folds minus two plus whatever rotation we're on, mod uh, n folds will, will give us the correct answer for that. Likewise for uh, for testing, uh, for train folds, we really want to we want want to acknowledge that we have not uh, a single fold that we're using for training, but a whole list of these uh, range train size will will give us that, uh, and then everything else is the same. Add a rotation to that. So range train size. If train size is three, then that will give us uh, the list zero, one, and two. Add our rotation for each of those uh, mod. Uh, n folds, and, and that gives us uh, a set of folds that are uh, independent of the valve folds and the test folds. All right, so a, a few details if we're doing this in a full formal, uh, if we're doing a full formal evaluation, uh, what we end up with is not constructing just a few models, but actually a whole bunch of different models, n by m by l. So n here is the number of folds and hence the number of rotations. Typically in my lab, we're working with 20. Uh, if you can get it up to 30, that's even better. Uh, m is the number of hyperparameter sets that we're choosing. It, I, hopefully that's just a few, but it could actually be quite a few. 
uh, and uh, and L is uh, the number of choices that we uh, can make with respect to uh, training set size. And uh, it's not unreasonable to to choose factors of two, so one, two, four, uh, etc. Uh, so when when we actually want to do this very formal kind of evaluation. Uh, We'll actually do a lot of informal work ahead of time to make uh, to make some choices about what this hyperparameter set of options should be, uh, and we might also uh, play a bit with training set size uh, ahead of time. Uh, and and we'll do that before we do the formal experiments. Um, of course, when you're doing that, you really should only be looking at validation set performance and never test set performance. So a few practicalities. The uh, question is how how small can n get? Central limit theorem says really 30 is where we want to be. 20 in practice is pretty good. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to see 10 uh, for, for very small data sets. You will also see down in the range of five, but, but now we're starting to get into regions where things like the t-test do not uh, perform very well, and you'll have to invoke other kinds of statistical methods. Um, in, in practice, this n by m by l turns out to be a lot of computation time, uh, and it's, all, it's not uncommon for that training set size question uh, to, to actually be pushed off to more of the exploratory stage of the, of the experiments uh, before we start to do uh, the, the formal uh, cross-validation. And the thing to keep in mind here is that that training set size uh, choice that we make um, does interact with hyperparameter uh, selection. So um, once you narrow down or decide that you have actually made, uh, you have enough training data to at least learn some models that are useful. Uh, you might lock that in and then uh, and then go about doing uh, hyperparameter searches. Okay, so holistic cross-validation. This is the procedure that gets used in my lab for most of what we do. Um, however, there are some caveats that one has to be uh, careful about. Um, so it is still the case that for a given rotation and hence model that the testing fold is, if we've done things right, is statistically independent of our training and validation folds. Um, however, when we make our decisions about uh, which hyperparameter set we actually want to use, we don't look at the validation performance for that single model, but actually look at the mean across all of the validation folds. Uh, and uh, at this point, we can run into a statistical problem, and that is because uh, validation for the validation fold for one rotation, so for the k minus the k plus one rotation, is the same fold as as we're using for testing in rotation k, uh, and and so that this means that our uh, validation performance and our test performance are not technically independent of one another, and furthermore, um, the, our test set our test set fold is also not truly independent of what we're using for training data. So, so one has to be a little bit cautious there, but nonetheless, this tends to actually uh, work uh, quite well for many different scenarios. Um, for, for situations where we do worry about these issues, um, I'm going to throw out one uh, other possible approach that's a generalization of what we talked about before. I'll term this orthogonal cross-validation. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, we have a fully independent uh, uh, validation and test uh, folds and hence performance measures uh, for all of our rotations. Um, and there are a variety of ways to get at this. Um, one approach is to use a holdout set for both one holdout set for validation data, another holdout set for testing data, and then we cut each of those into their own uh, n folds. So that procedure looks uh, something like this. Uh, so this is the green is all the data that we've uh, that we've pulled from the universe, 
uh, and then we've cut uh, folds. Uh, we have folds zero through n minus one, but each of those is cut into a separate test validation and, and training data set. So again, there are a variety of ways to to uh, actually do this procedure. Here is one that we feel very com comfortable with. Uh, he here, the idea is for a rotation zero and hence model zero. We use the training set, the training piece of our folds uh, zero through n minus three for the training process, and then the validation section of fold n minus two for to compute our v zero, and the uh, the testing portion of fold n minus one to compute uh, te zero. One rotation on, uh, everything rotates to the right mod n, and so our test test data now are here, our validation data come from here, and our training data are folds one through n minus two. Rotation two, again, is one more step. Uh, beyond that. So we're using folds, the training section of folds two through n minus one for our training purposes. Okay, so, so the, this we feel even more confident about these validation and testing uh, uh, metrics being independent of one another. However, we are leaving for each of our rotations, we are leaving some of the available data uh, untouched. Um, so in that, in this picture here, all of this non-purple data, that's that's not being touched in, in the process of training, uh, testing, and validation. Um, and so that inherently means that we have less data available for each of those different procedures, which can, can lead to uh, different kinds of problems, especially when our, our, our available data set is really small. Um, however, what we do get out of this is, is this uh, confidence about uh, independence in these different measures. And, and in fact, I, sh I should say that we're actually experimenting with this procedure in, in one of our experiments uh, right now. All right, so, so a few takeaways uh, to take a step back from what we've talked about today. Um, first off, statistical evaluation matters. Every model we build and every model we evaluate, this is a statistical process that we have to, uh, we, we have to uh, acknowledge that we are sampling from random variables. There are lots of different approaches uh, to this uh, and which one you choose is going to depend on whether you're doing informal experiments or more formal uh, kinds of experiments. Um, but a, a few things to, and and also uh, the nature of the data that you're sampling from can also affect your choice of cross-validation procedure. However, in anything that you choose, it's really important to not confuse validation and test data sets. And this is one of the things that happens in, uh, in many of our books and many of the blog posts out there, they mix those terms together as if they're the same concept and they are not at all the same context. Uh, this, the same concept. Uh, so, uh, and along those lines, you're allowed at any point in the procedure to look at validation performance. However, do not look at your test data performance until uh, the, the very late stages of your evaluation process. Um, with, however, there's this caveat that it's often really convenient to compute those test measures uh, on the fly as you're building the models, evaluation, evaluating the validation data sets, but uh, don't look at them either algorithmically or, or by human eye. Um, and then also it's really important to, uh, to make sure that uh, in any of these procedures that there is statistical independence between the uh, individual folds. And uh, depending upon the nature of your data, uh, this might actually be hard to achieve. So for example, if you're dealing with time series data, there are statistical dependencies from one sample to the next. And you need to make sure that in your building of your folds that you break those statistical uh, dependencies. All right, thank you very much.